much, Rob. Um, yes, I, I feel quite excited. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to start a, a series on, on uh, the letter of James. Um, it's a book which I'm really uh, intrigued with. Um, and I think after um, Roger's picture this morning, it has particular relevance because it helps us to be what I would call consistent Christians. It's a very practical book. It has a lot to teach us and to tell us about how we can be practical, relevant Christians in the society in which we live. Now, the first uh, is the first of five of a series, and I've called it um, Introduction and Trials. And you'll see why as we go on. Now, at this point, I'm going to try and uh, split the screen so that I can go on to And just bear with me for a moment. There we are. We're getting there. We're gradually getting there. And here we are. There we are. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the introduction to James, just about uh, what it is to the do believe that the book of James was written by James, who was widely considered to be the brother of Jesus. Um, and it was very particularly around, I love the way that uh, we had the nativity scene this morning. Um, Sue and Peter did a wonderful job of portraying the nativity scene. Um, but I wonder if you can imagine that they, of course, they went on to have other children after Jesus was born, and there was a family of anything up to seven children, we believe. If you think of the fact that uh, Jesus was 30 before he started his ministry, that means for many years they were living as a family. And there must have been some point where perhaps Mary, if Joseph was still alive, he was there as well. They sat the family down one day after a meal and they said, look, we've got to explain to you about Jesus because um, Joseph is not his father. And if you can imagine them trying to explain to them the scene that we've just seen, and uh, explain that, yes, you're all um, Joseph and Mary's pair, uh, children, but Jesus was somebody special. Yes, Mary is his mother, but he was born in a special way. Try and imagine, if you will, the effect that that would have had on the children. Now, I don't want to go into a lot of um, guesswork here, but we do know that um, John chapter 7, verse 5 tells us this. There was a point at which in Jesus's ministry, he was going up to the temple and he said to the family you're coming up and they said no and it says even his own brothers did not believe in him so whatever they knew about jesus his origin and the purpose why he was there he looked like one of them but he clearly was segregated he was separated from ministry at that point they didn't believe him and yet not many years later we read in Galatians 2 and verse 9, Paul, having been converted from Saul and now um, going to be a missionary in the church, in Galatians 2 9, he says, James, Peter and John, they're reputed to be pillars in the church. So in a comparatively few years, James, from being an unbelieving member of Mary's family, looking at his elder brother, not believing who he was, has now become a pillar of the church. I think one can read into that the fact that in these intervening years, we don't know at what point James was converted, James came to believe in Jesus, but the very first words of the passage we're going to read in a moment in James says, he's, he talks about the Lord Jesus Christ. In the first verse, it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, James here is not just talking about his elder brother. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, the full title of the Lord Jesus. So it's amazing when you look at this letter, and I think you'll find as we unfold it, there's an awful lot about the characteristic of this letter, which reminds us of the way Jesus taught. Jesus cut to the chase. He didn't waste words. He got to the point. He got to the point at issue. And we'll find as we look at James that James did very much the same thing. He doesn't waste words. 
he gets down to the matter in hand. And uh, it's quite a full letter. Um, we'll find as we've got a limited time at our disposal, um, you'll have to hold on to your seats because we'll have to cover ground quite quickly. But I hope it will raise issues which not only will challenge you, but will bless you. Now, that's the establishes who James was. When was it written? Well, scholars do vary on this. Some say that it was written quite early, and I'm going to put this on. I hope you can see it. Uh, don't be too worried. But you'll find that James and Galatians at the top um, in quite large letters. Down at the bottom, you'll see one and three John and Revelation in big letters. And there's a time scale at the top. And we believe that James was probably written one of the, well, the earliest New Testament book between sort of 40 and 50 AD. Now, the reason by the some doubt is some people think it was written nearer AD 60 and was written round about the same time as Romans. And they say that for this reason, that Paul talks about, of course, the great warrior's truth of justification by faith, that we're we're justified, we're declared righteous through the blood of Christ. And that is by faith, it's nothing we do. When you come to James, you can get a superficial impression that James is saying, well, faith is no good. Works is the thing that saves us. Faith without works is dead, he says at one time. And famously, Martin Luther at the time of the Reformation looked at James and he, he called it a, a straw epistle. He thought he didn't think much of it because he was captivated, of course, by the idea of justification by faith. Luther, this priest who'd been doing everything he could by works to establish himself with God and totally failed, discovered through reading Romans and Galatians that we weren't saved by what we do. We were saved by trusting in the blood of the Lord Jesus. Justification by faith alone, through grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone. And... Uh, in fact, um, I'm going to opt for the earlier date that James has written early, um, because I believe, and we'll see this when we come to look further in the book of James, that there really is no difference between these two things at all. Yes, we are justified by faith entirely in Christ. And yet faith, as we shall see, unless it's accompanied with works, unless it manifests itself in something which is real, and a practical value and can be seen in the world, one can question whether faith actually exists there at all. Now, if you take this date at about 45 to 50 AD, just think for a moment what was happening. Jesus died in around about 33 AD. The church started not very long afterwards. Pentecost was in the middle 30s. So we're talking about a period of less than 10 years. If you think of the church as it was in Jerusalem, wonderfully established, filled with the spirit, thousands converted, a real move of miracles, people being raised from the dead. I mean, the church was just as it had been prophesied to be filled with the spirit. And yet when Stephen was martyred and the church was spread abroad, we see that it went all over the Middle East as it was at the time. There is Jerusalem over on the right hand side and you can see those arrows pointing to how Christians were dispersed throughout the world in the Middle East at that time. And we read in Acts that wherever they went, they went spreading the gospel. These were people on fire with the Spirit. They were filled with the Spirit, filled with the knowledge and relationship with the living Lord Jesus Christ and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And wherever they were, they preach the gospel. So you can imagine all around here were being planted churches, groups of people who love God. And they were predominantly Jews, but not exclusively Jews. There were Gentiles as well who were being added to the church. And so James, in his opening verses, described himself, he's writing to the 12 tribes. In other words, these people who have been dispersed throughout uh, the Middle East here. And the point I want to establish very early on, if I can, is this, that we cannot assume that because we trust Christ for salvation and we're filled with the Spirit, that our behavior can be taken for granted. Now, we know that from very early in the church when it was filled with the Spirit in Jerusalem, 
Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira, you remember, were two people who tried to cheat God out of some of the money they'd, they'd sold their house, their property. They were giving to the church and they said they'd given one sum and they held some back. And Peter confronted with them and they both actually died. It was a shocking event which must have shaken the church at the time. So we see that everything wasn't perfect and we see and we know not only from what scripture teaches but from our own experience that our lives have to conform with the faith we confess and this is what James is at pains to to point out here. Now at this stage I just want to read the first 18 verses. Um, if you've got your Bibles it will be really helpful for you to have them open. If you haven't I'm going to put them on the screen so we can read it and you can read it together. So here we go. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea. Blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double minded man, unstable in all his ways. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because he will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises in scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom fails and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised for those who love him. When tempted, no one should say God is tempting me for God cannot be tempted by evil nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full blown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the, womb, the word of truth, that he might be a, a word, a kind of first fruits in all he created. Now, it's impossible to do a verse by verse exposition in the time we have. So I want to look at five aspects of what we're reading here and just give you a, a, a summary, a, a, a sense of what James is teaching here so that we can perhaps understand and benefit a little more hopefully be provoked and blessed and helped by what James is teaching us. So there are five things that, that, Paul, that, that, that James is saying in this, this section. And the first one is trials. Immediately, he says, having introduced himself, he says, now look, brothers and sisters, you are going to find trials. Many of them already done so, of course, because they'd been spread from Jerusalem. And this is a teaching which is throughout the New Testament. Peter, in his general epistles, says exactly the same thing, that you will experience problems. Trials will be there. And Jesus himself said exactly the same. John 16, 33 said, in the world, you will have trouble. And, and it's probably a basic truth that we're well aware of, well acquainted with, because we've experienced it. But we find ourselves as Christians, we find ourselves born again, citizens of heaven, pilgrims on a journey. But we're in a world and we're experiencing the nature of a sinful world dominated by Satan. And therefore, we're going to come against, we're going to clash with the values and the spirit 
of the world, in quotes. But God says he will use these trials, he will use it to refine and to strengthen us. And as James says here, perseverance brings the crown of life. And if you look at verses two to four, and then you look down to verse 12, it's almost as if they're the bookends. There he's saying, and again in verse 12, look, perseverance will bring you the crown of life. If you, if you work through this, you will gain the crown of life. This is precisely the same teaching that Paul brings in his letters. And so in between here, James is saying, look, you're going to have trials, but I'm going to outline some of these and how you can overcome them, what the power is that you have at your disposal. Now, one of the things about James is that he doesn't mention much about what doctrine that we get in the other epistles, the epistles particularly of Paul. He doesn't talk to us about the Lord Jesus Christ very much at all. In fact, does he mention the name of Christ? You can have a look and see if you can find it. What I want to suggest to you is that because of the early date that is written, a lot of this he doesn't have to deal with because it's happening. These Christians are filled with the Spirit. They know Jesus. In fact, at that stage in the life of the church, all the confession that they needed to have was that, well, Jesus Christ is Lord, and that, that said everything. So there were no problems, really, that uh, James had to deal with here. He could everywhere assume that they were living in the light and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, there would be truths that would have to be contested and con contested for, which come later, and that's what Paul deals with. But here in James, he's dealing mainly with the, the outworkings of the Christian life. How should a Christian behave? How should they react in this world in which they live? What should their lives look like? And that's what he's dealing with. So having dealt with trials, he then goes on to wisdom. He says, if any man lack wisdom, he should ask of God. So what, what is wisdom? What is it? Well, I suppose in its raw sense, in its basic sense, it's the, the application of knowledge. It's all very well to have your head stuck with knowledge, but what do you do with it? And it's, it's what you do with it and how you apply it that at root is, is wisdom. And wisdom is needed in, in the world in all sorts of different ways. There are many wise people, perhaps, who aren't even Christians, and they're very good at applying the knowledge they've got in a sensible way to the issues which confront them. But I'm not looking about that sort of wisdom. I'm looking at more what the Bible says. He says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So we're dealing here with a wisdom which is predominantly a spiritual wisdom. It's how we deal with, how we, how we help and tackle with the, the wisdom, the knowledge that we have. And we all need this, don't we? We all need wisdom. You may have a neighbor who lives down the road who, who is showing a little bit of interest in, in church life in this time of, of, uh, of lockdown. And you're, you're possibly saying, well, how can I, I've got this faith, I've got this love of Christ, I want to share it with them, how can I do it? And you need wisdom. You can blurt out biblical truth and it might put them off and they never come near you again. But you need wisdom so that you can carefully, at the right moment, outline what it is that motivates you, why you're a Christian, why you can say, I love Jesus. And you need wisdom for that. While I was thinking about this, I was thinking of, and I, I haven't asked him if I can, but I, I'm going to take Rob as an example. Now, Rob not only helps to look after us, he looks after the uh, Lancaster Church. He has, he has responsibilities in many of the church plants, other churches that form part of our our family of churches in Christ Central, and he's in touch with them. He's already told us he's in touch with uh, the church in in in, Stock, in uh, Gothenburg, and in all these people, leaders will will be looking for Rob and Joe for advice, help. What do we do here? And and daily, numerous times, I have no doubt, Rob and Joe will want wisdom. They'll cry out to God for wisdom. Lord, how can I help them? What can I say into this situation that will block? How can I unblock this problem? How can I help? And it's a problem that church leaders have. We as elders want wisdom so that we know how to lead and guide you, our family of churches. So we need wisdom and we cry out. And James says, if you need wisdom, ask me of God, because God will give it and he will give wisdom liberally. 
is a liberal God. And for us as Christians, I would suggest that wisdom here, James is saying, it's, it's really, in a sense, it's a spiritual insight which saves us from reverting to unregenerate ways. As Christians, we're always tempting that Satan will always tempt us back into the ways of the world. He will tempt us back to do things and see things as the world sees them. And wisdom here is to differentiate between what the Spirit is saying and what Satan will entice us into believing. And true wisdom in this sense is to know how to follow God when the world is dragging us in a different direction. And that is really what wisdom is. And, Paul, and James is saying here, he, God will give it to you in great measure if you ask him. And then we come on to verses six and seven, because James goes on to say, um, it's a terrible thing to doubt. You're asking for wisdom. You're trying to live this Christian life. Now, don't doubt. And doubting is, is wavering. It's wavering. It's following Jesus with a heart that's hankering after the sinful world. And as Christians, we can be guilty of that sometimes. We can want to follow Jesus with one idea and with another idea. We're looking at the world and all its temptations, all the things that attracts. And we say, well, you know, I do want to follow Jesus, but, you know, I do want to follow the things of the world. And we're torn apart and there is doubts in our minds. And that sort of doubt, James comes against. He says, you can't waver. You're like a boat being tossed around, and there's, that's disaster was likely to follow you. And it's like the Israelites. Remember, they were in the wilderness. They were on track. They got Moses. They'd been delivered from the power of the Egyptians and the power of slavery, and there they were. And yet time after time, they murmured, they moaned, and at times they said, we'd rather go back to Egypt. We knew where we were there. Doubting, doubting, doubting is not good. But I'm mindful that there is a sense in which we can doubt and Jesus understands. You remember the story of, of Thomas who after the resurrection, the disciples had seen the Lord, the risen Lord, and Thomas said, no, I can't believe I'm, I'm he's called doubting Thomas, isn't he? Until I feel those wounds, I'm not gonna believe. And Jesus made a point when he appeared to the disciples of going up to Thomas and saying, now look, Thomas, you feel these wounds. I'm here, you're seeing me. Now believe, and Thomas believed. And I believe there is a sense in which we can often have doubts, which are genuine doubts. You may be a Christian of fairly not many, many years standing, and you don't fully understand things, and there are lots of things you doubt, and you, you don't like to admit to it because it looks as if you're not a very good Christian. And I think there is a sense in which God would say to you, look, I will come just like Jesus came to Thomas. I will come to you. I will show you in a sense, Jesus says, my wounds. I will show you why I died for you. I will, I will heal those doubts in you. If you have honest doubts and you come to God and you say, God, I, I don't really understand. I have doubts about who you are. I have doubts about who you are. And, and particularly, I have doubts, Lord, about myself because I can see that other people love me, but I can't love myself. I, I can't think that you love me. I can understand why you love these other people, but not me. And I believe God in his love and his mercy comes to you, and he doesn't condemn you for those doubts, but he wants to not only heal them, but establish who you are, establish the fact that he does love you, that he's got purposes for you, and he wants to heal those doubts, to get rid of them, so that you become a believer and not a doubter. So I think that's a true thing and a, and a valuable thing to learn about what James is here saying about doubting. There's a sense in which if you waver, if you look to the world and not to Christ, you're in danger of tossing around like a boat without a rudder. Then fourthly, he comes on to status. And in verses 9 to 11, he's, he's looking at a rich person coming into a, a church and the, 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 the leaders of the church sort of putting him in a posh seat and everybody else sort of sits in, in, in miserable seats or on the floor. And he's painting a picture here of how we can be divisive within the church. And as I was looking at this, I, I just want to paint a picture to you of, of what an early church might have looked like. Imagine if you can, one of these groups 
there's a group in this town and they've got a wonderful thriving church going. And here is a rich man. He lives a very rich lifestyle. He's very well thought of in the town and the community. He dresses well and he's converted. He hears about Jesus. He believes him. He receives the spirit and he's thrilled with what he's experiencing about this new life. And he's introduced into the church. And then he goes along with this group of people. And he just wasn't prepared for what he saw there because there is a mix of people in this group. There are men and women. And that himself is, is, is a shock to him. But he says, not only that, but he says, well, there are slaves here. There are, there are, there are vagabonds, there, there, are, there are rough people here. And I'm quite a refined person. I'm used to refined tastes and, 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 and a good standard of living. And here is this group of people and as he comes amongst them, worship starts. Just, just picture this with me. And somebody starts a song and they start singing glory to God and they raise their hands and some of the dancing and they sing. And then somebody comes up and they bring a prophecy out of the Pentateuch and uh, it's all about Jesus, his promise and people are touched and they're moved by this. And then somebody, just imagine it, it gets a little bit quiet and an old lady comes up and she's got straggly hair and she's very poorly dressed and those who stand beside her are aware that she hasn't washed for several days and this rich man looks in horror and she comes up to the middle and she starts she starts praying and praising God and suddenly there's quiet in this group and it's almost as if heaven opens and because of her words she introduces and the the the, the, the presence of God becomes so manifest that some people fall down and they're on their faces before him and outstretched arms and and there's a sort of glow in the place and an extraordinary effect and then when she finishes praying she starts bringing words of knowledge and she'll point to one another and they cry out and they fall down and here's one over here screaming because the spirit comes out of him, an evil spirit and it's almost in this group as if there's a controlled sense of confusion. There's utter bedlam going on. And yet, over it, there's a wonderful spirit of glory and of honor, as if God is in control of this pandemonium. Can you catch the picture? And this man is, is, is drawn to it, and yet he's scandalized. He's scandalized because there are women here, and he's not used to meeting, having meetings in the company of women. And also he's scandalized because of the different classes of society there. And as he tries to wrestle with these things, though, an elder of the church just leads him off and says, brother, you've got a lot to learn about the Christian life. You've got a lot to learn about the church. You've got to learn that we're all equal before God. And that this woman who you in your heart despise is very close to God. She's very filled with the spirit. And what she does blesses and glorifies this group of people. And it just helps them along the line, along the word of life. And this man goes home and he says, oh, I've got so much to learn about what this church is or what, what this Christian life is like. Can you imagine it? And this is what James is really saying here. You've got to understand not to draw distinctions. Now, I haven't time to apply this in detail, but I want you to, to apply in your own thinking about how the church is in the 21st century, how the church is, how you would like to see it, how it should be as we group, as we meet as the family of God. Do we have this problem? We've already faced issues. Jo dealt with it very powerfully a few Sundays ago when she talked about racism. There are gender issues, people of uncertain gender issues, and this is much as a hot topic in society as it is. How do, we, how do we respond in a church? How do we view status? Are all people, regardless of the gender, regardless of their sexuality, regardless of their sex, regardless of who they are in society, are they safe? Are they welcome? amongst the people who are seeking God and who want to see the glory of God manifest amongst them. Oh, this, this does come home and hit us quite hard, doesn't it? It makes us and provokes us to think what James has to say about status.
he also quotes about flesh and he's quoting probably from Isaiah 40 where he reminds us of all flesh is grass. We're all the same, <laughs> whatever our status, whatever our gender, whatever our age group, we're all like grass. We're here, we fade, but the glory of God goes on forever. These are things that are meant to make us think and provoke us. And then fifthly, he goes on to talk about temptation. He'll have more to say about this, but he's talking about in verses 13 to 15 about temptation. And we remind ourselves in temptation that it's, it's Satan who tempts. He tempted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That was at a time, of course, when Adam and Eve had no sin in their hearts. They were, they were sinless. But he, he tempted them to, as a matter of choice, do you, want to, do you want to do what I'm going to tell you, or do you want to obey what God has told you? And sadly for mankind, they chose to believe what Satan said rather than what God has said. And of course, when Jesus was tempted, Jesus had no sin in his life. He was tempted to short circuit the way in which God had planned salvation. He was trying to, Satan tried to circuit, to, to short circuit what God had planned and tempt Jesus. But whereas Adam and Eve failed, Jesus gloriously triumphed. But in between this, we who do have sin in our lives still, we are declared righteous, but we still have sin to conquer. And Satan can use that sin to, to tempt us, to tempt us back into the world. And James is very clear on this subject. We know that it's not a sin to be tempted, but it is a sin to fall to temptation, to give way to it and not resist it. And James says here, look, unresisted temptation can only lead in one direction, and that is it leads to death. It's a very important thing, and it's one that should make us think, you know, am I, am I standing up to temptation? Am I resisting it in the power that God gives me? Or do I find I'm wavering, I'm giving way? Now, God will help us in this. But just remember that what John James says here, that unresisted, if you give up and don't resist temptation, it leads to sin and it leads to death. It's, it's, quite, a strong, it's a, quite a strong statement that James is saying here, and we need to, to take it to heart. Remembering that this is in the bracket. James has said, look, you're going to have trials. If you resist trials, um, and you, you, the, the world, you persevere, there will be a crown of life at the end. But in the middle, there are these things. You can have wisdom. He will help you. If you have doubts, you must deal with them. Recognize that in status, we are all equal before God, and therefore don't differentiate in the wrong sense between rich people and poor people and the other ones that I've mentioned. You will be tempted, but make sure you resist temptation. And these are the trials. These are some of the things that James is saying can can affect you and he's writing to people who he hasn't seen perhaps who are dispersed but he is aware of what they can fall into and he's trying to give them help and guidance and strength to resist so that their faith can be consistent and lastly in these verses 16 to 18 he's talking about God's gift and I can hear in what James is saying here shades of what John will later write in his gospel when he writes about the word being made flesh. And I go back to what I said about the nativity where I can imagine Mary trying to explain to James and the other children what was special about Jesus. And as we saw that nativity scene, we can just imagine Mary trying to unpack that to her family of children that were born to her and Joseph and saying, look, this is what happened to Jesus. Angels came. I was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was born in a stable. We had to flee. We had to go to Egypt for a year or so because we became refugees. And now here we are back in Nazareth. We're living. We've got a carpentry business. We're, we're stable. But that was the background. And the family and James trying to understand who Jesus is, who he was. And 
the birth, the word was made flint. And we're living in this period of what we call Advent. We're looking forward to Christmas. We're looking forward to remembering Jesus's birth. And it's almost as if what he's saying here, and, and James is saying, yes, Jesus was born. And because of his birth, because of his life and death and resurrection, all this truth of Christian life is what we're living in, what we're triumphing in, and what I'm trying to teach you in. And he's saying, we have a new birth too. Just as Jesus was born, we have a new birth. We are the first fruits and we are precious to God. And this is really concluding this passage which we're looking at at the moment. We'll go on to look at more at James. It's an exciting book, but I hope even what we've looked at so far will, will galvanize you, will make you think. Years ago, um, th there's one of the Christian publishing houses, the IVP, the InterVarsity Press, which has over the years produced some, some wonderful titles. And there was a title when I was a student, um, which was popular and was popular sometime afterwards, a book by Michael Gribb is called Consistent Christianity. And I've looked for it, it's, it's long been out of print, but actually I went on Amazon and it's there. <laughs> you can get it from secondhand bookshops at about two pounds 80. But it's a wonderful book, and it, it was the title as much as anything, Consistent Christianity. We can claim wonderful truth, truth that is real truth from the Bible, which is true for us about our new birth, about our being baptized in the Spirit, filled with the Spirit. But our lives have to bear fruit. Our lives have to be consistent. And what I hope to share with you as we go through and journey through James is that consistency that he's looking for. We're looking to impact people. And I was, I was excited with, with Roger's um, picture of the gray area and suddenly that blue flash of the kingfisher. And that's what our lives need to be. So we need to have consistency. So I believe that James will help us to, to live a life which is consistent so that people can see not just a weird lot of bunch of people who have sort of strange beliefs and meet together, but people whose lives are attractive in the sense they say, well, how do you remain calm? You seem to have got a sort of wisdom as you look at life and you've got some, some sensible things to say about how life should be lived. And you don't seem to, to, to worry about uh, whether people are rich or poor. And uh, you seem to to cope with life. How is that? You can say, well, it's Jesus in me that makes the difference. God help us to, to have lives which really reflect the beauty of Jesus. Amen. Well, I'll stop there and I'll, I'll hand back to, uh, uh, to, to Rob. Thanks, Rob.